Hey scholars, this is our PowerPoint lecture video for chapter five on the building blocks of argument for our argumentation class. So please make sure you have the PowerPoint presentation out in front of you that is available uh, alongside the same module where you found it on our course page. Um, I always recommend for students to have the PowerPoint up and the video up at the same time and just treat this like a, a, a classroom experience where you're listening and taking notes, have your textbook out, like be writing notes in your textbook. Um, maybe refer to other parts of your textbook to help you understand, to, to enhance your understanding of things. That's what I would do a lot when I was in college, where I'd be in the classroom or, or lecturing or the teacher's lecturing or having a discussion on chapter seven. But as you know, during the class time, I would look at chapter five and I would look through chapter four. I would, I would read, review different things periodically briefly to help me understand um, what's going on that particular day. So just a tip or a helpful hint on different ways you can be utilizing your time with, during online learning. Okay, so chapter five is is kind of a an extension in a way or a, a further addition or part two of chapter three, where chapter three primarily we're focusing on the Twoman model where you were learning about the, the basics. I mean, that's almost like building blocks of argument part one. This is building blocks of argument part two. Maybe that's a, a better way to describe the chapters. Not that I'm criticizing Gas and Cider. They're the experts. They've written lots of books. So anyhow, um, one thing I've talked about is this this metaphor of, of building arguments, you know, building an argument as a, a metaphor, using a building as a metaphor. The, the quality of essential materials, that's that's key, right? If you try to um, build something, if you could try to construct a house that's made of poor materials and they're, if it's bad, if it's, if it's poorly, con, um, if it's poor materials and they're poorly constructed, you have a very poor development. You have a very bad building. It lacks um, structural support, right? It's not something that would be safe. An inspector wouldn't pass it. If, if you saw this house on the slide number two, if I said, hey, look, I just built this this house, what do you think? And if you're a building expert or you're a building inspector or you're in construction, you're gonna look at that and say like, yeah, you didn't do a great job. Um, obviously this house is an old, it's an old building. But if I said, yeah, you know what? I, 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 repurposed, I repurposed a roof that uh, I found in a, in, a, in a dumpster and all that kind of stuff, you're like, wait a minute. Like, yeah, technically that's a building, but it's a very poorly constructed building. So as we're belaboring the building metaphor, you can have an argument. Just because you have an argument doesn't mean that it's necessarily something to be proud of. It might not make any sense. It might lack uh, credible evidence. You might have evidence, but it's not good evidence. It's not credible evidence. It's not evidence that would be um, accepted by the majority. It's not evidence that would be accepted by the experts. So in your mind, you're thinking, do I have an argument? I have the claim. I have the grounds. There's a warrant. It's like, yeah, it doesn't, it, you're, you're committing fallacies and it doesn't really, doesn't hold its weight with the building. You're like, yeah, I, I built this, but, um, you know, it's not, it's not the, the, the best, it's not the best construction. Um, okay. So building metaphor. Garbage in, garbage out. You, you know, you, you can only get so much good out of something if you're not putting good into it, right? So slide number three, claim spotting. The authors talk about claim spotting. What's your point? So the one of the questions is, how do you know when a claim has been made? And sometimes you don't. Sometimes you don't know when a claim is made. How do I know if someone is actually, if they're sort of presenting an argument, if it, it, it sounds like they're presenting an argument, if you're in that situation, if you're the kind of person where you're like, oh, it sounds like they're making some sort of an assertion or argument about a topic, maybe it's controversial, maybe it's not controversial, but it's a topic and I know a lot about that topic or it, sound, it sounds interesting, but I wanna know more. Um, don't make any assumptions. Don't, don't just say like, so are you arguing that X causes Y? Don't, don't make that assumption, just ask, ask clarifying questions. I, I have the horse picture in there to uh, just to help you remember to help you remember things, right? The the authors reference the whole horse thing on the the bottom of page uh, eighty two. It says, suppose a cowpoke cautions a greenhorn at at a dude ranch about a testy horse. Uh, I laugh because our authors have an extremely dry sense of humor and they're they're funny anyhow. Anyhow, um, Buddy may be fixing to bite you. His ears are pinned back. So the cowpoke's 
claim or point is buddy may be fixing to bite you his ears are pinned back provides support for this claim so um what's what's the warrant i, I mean what's i just gave it away right uh the warrant is pinned ears and so if if you know anything about horses you know what the warrant is maybe you don't know anything about horses so you what so you might be thinking okay i saw i see the claim i see the grounds this horse might bite you because his ears are pinned back and you're thinking huh it sounds like there's a connection between ears being pinned back and a horse biting and even if you don't know about much about horses you could probably figure it out but i just wanted to just give you another sort of a visual metaphor um, of claim ground and warrant all in one you see the picture you see the picture of the horse on the right happy horse ears are up picture on the left ears back so if you see a horse doing that leave it alone. I don't know much about horses. My dad does. My dad is a, a huge horse um, lover and used to have a horse, used to ride in competition and stuff like that. So um, anyhow, that's just something to help you remember a claim, claim grounds warrant, all in one um, snapshot. Um, the, the case is also true with cats when cats ears are pinned back, leave them alone. Usually not a good thing. So moving on to, to factual claims. The authors describe a factual claim as an empirically verifiable uh, thing. In other words, something is objectively true or an object it's objectively true or objectively false. Just because somebody, just because somebody presents a fact doesn't mean that it's true. And I think that's one issue that a lot of people experience. We hear these things uh, called facts being presented on our social media feeds, in the news, in books, etc., and we just assume like, well. Here's, here's the facts, Jack, right? Look at the facts. Well, just because something is a fact doesn't mean that it's true, according to formal logic, according to this textbook, right? If you bring up that, if you bring that up in a conversation, if you say like, hey, just because it's a fact doesn't mean it's true, um, it, it might be a true fact and, and you might find yourself embarrassed. So make sure you know what you're talking about before you call someone out on that. So, um, so that's what a factual claim is or a fact it's it's something that is empirically verifiable i i can i can either i can investigate about what you said and then you can i can i can support it as being true or support it as being false the authors talk about faux facts alternative facts um oh just because something is uh not true if, if it's a if it's a faux fact or a, a false fact um it's 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 in that category you hear these like facts being presented in different stories and whatnot and later it turns out like oh it's an alternative fact um that's that's kind of what they're talking about what the what the authors are talking about in these sections where it says faux facts alternative facts there's another element to understanding all this called um preponderance of evidence and that you'll find on uh the bottom of 85 going into 86 they talk about the preponderance of evidence it refers to the majority of weight, the majority or weight of the evidence falling on one side of an issue. So if you are a, if, if, you're, if you're familiar with the law, if you're familiar with practicing law, if, if, if you're familiar with what it means to be an attorney or a juror or a judge, if you know that system, you know that that is, is relevant. The, the concept of preponderance of evidence. If, if you and I, if, if we're all part of a uh, a team of 12 jurors and we're trying it's one of those words where you, if you say the word correctly it just sounds funny juror anyhow if we're all jurors in this in this court case and we're trying to decide whether the person is innocent or guilty what are we looking at we're not just looking at their face and saying do they seem guilty um you shouldn't be doing that but you're looking at the evidence and so if the evidence if you're like man all the evidence all the evidence is pointing in the direction of guilty or not guilty right um and that's how they can that's how they can come up with a, a complete decision and if, if it's not a complete decision you know in, in, a, in a in a jury if it's 12 to 1 i mean if it's if it's 12 if 12 say guilty or 12 say not guilty all right it's, it's they're done but if if 11 says if 11 say guilty one says not guilty well now you have a hung jury now they gotta they gotta work it out and that is the basis of the whole, uh, that is the, the whole basis of the film, 12 Angry Men. If you haven't yet seen that film, I definitely recommend that you do. It's, re it's really interesting. I'm guessing the majority of you probably saw it at some point in high school or college class. So I mention this because it's relevant to what we're talking about here, the preponderance of evidence. Um, 
the as I mentioned uh, in the notes below, I say, was the inclusion of the knife by juror number eight compelling enough to create reasonable doubt? Part of part of um, how, how can I be so sure about something? How does, how does a jury come up with a decision? Well, it's beyond a reasonable doubt. We found that this person is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. All the evidence stacks up in terms of pointing them towards guilty. There's a preponderance, preponderance of evidence showing their guilt. But this is a film, and uh, by the way, in the film, he doesn't have a name. Henry Fonda's character is just known, just known as juror number eight. So everybody in the courtroom is like, he's guilty. Look at, you got the knife, you got this, you got that. They they are convinced that that this guy is guilty. Um, because they 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 were convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that he was guilty. But then juror number eight, Henry Fonda, says, Hey, I have the same knife. Uh, so I gave it away, you know. Uh, uh, spoiler alert, but it came out in 1957, so you've had a lot of a lot of time to watch it. He brings out the same knife and basically says, like, hey, look, here, here's the proof, the empirically verifiable proof that I do have the same knife, and that's relevant to the clip. So make sure you watch this clip. Um, it's fun, it's interesting, it's really short, and it's relevant to what we're talking about. But is that enough? It's like how much how much evidence do you need? From someone, whether it's whether you're a juror or whether you're an attorney or whether you're in a, you're in a relationship, whether you're working with a client or a customer or a family member or a student, and you're trying to determine if 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 someone's guilty or not guilty or, or if something did or didn't happen, you're looking at evidence. Like, what do I need in order to have a shadow of doubt? The knife that would probably do it. Um, or I use the, the building metaphor again. If you if you were inspecting a newly constructed house. Right, you're looking at this house. It looks great. Everything is ship shape, plumb and square and level and all that stuff, right? Whatever the terms building uh, contractors use or inspectors use. Um, the house looks great, but there's this one very, very minor leak and it's coming through the kitchen floor. Now, I don't know much about construction, but if you know anything about construction and you saw a brand new house, if it all looks great on the outside, on the inside, you check the plumbing and electrical, hey, this is awesome, but I just noticed there's a, there's literally water coming up through the kitchen floor. So is that enough to create a reasonable doubt that there might be something wrong? There might be a, a, a bigger problem that we might want to take a look at? Yeah, probably. Um, is that knife enough to, to get the jury to get the jury to say, hey, is that knife enough to get us to rethink things? So this is kind of like the, song, the whole song and dance of, of arguing. It's complex. It's complicated. There's a lot of factors involved. So that's that. That's preponderance of evidence. And then there's the the hypothetical facts. Um, the authors mention if the Titanic hadn't had hit the iceberg uh, head on, it wouldn't have sunk. Or if it weren't for this, then that would have happened. If X never happened, then Y would have never happened. If X did happen, then Y would have happened. And and you've probably had conversations like this with people, probably more so in a, a fun social way. Like let's say talk about film. If you're there's certain types of films that have a sort of a, a unique culture, a unique culture to the to the film series, uh, to the film, especially film series like Harry Potter, Star Wars, um, Marvel, all that, all those types of, of, of films that have you know comic books to go with them. There's lots of information. You have people, you have people who know a lot about them, and they might have um, conversations, discussions. Well, if Thor didn't do that, then um, I don't know those characters that well. Then, uh, then Captain Marvel wouldn't have done something else. Anyhow, the point is, those are hypothetical facts. Those don't really test. The, you can't really test those very well. So you might say, what if Neo had chosen the blue pill? For those of you who are fans of uh, the Matrix, if you've seen the Matrix, um, then you know the the whole premise of the film is Neo chose the red pill, and it changed everything. But what if you had chosen the blue pill? Maybe maybe you're in a matrix culture club. I don't know. But let's just say that exists, hypothetically. They might say, well, if Neo had chosen the blue, the, the blue pill, then this would have happened and that wouldn't have happened and so on and so forth. Then you could have long, detailed conversations using what sounds like maybe good evidence, but the whole point, it's hypothetical. And so you never know. You don't know what you don't know. Um, that's one way to think about it. So next slide, slide six to, to further help you understand this it lacks in, empirical verifiability the specific you know textbook the textbook uh, explanation 
Why does it not work? Why is a hypothetical fact not not strong or convincing or credible? It lacks empirical verifiability. You can't you can't prove that something would have happened if something else didn't happen or did happen. It just doesn't make sense. Like I said, you don't know what you don't know. Now, there's a concept in 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 um, the scientific method and, and doing research and whatnot called counterfactual counterfactual reason. There's a lot of there's a lot of words and terms to describe this concept of counterfactual. I highly recommend. Please watch this video. Click the link next the hyperlink where it says counterfactual, and you'll hear this professor. He's a professor of economics, and he's explaining the whole concept of counterfactual, which is essentially dealing with this whole concept of hypothetical facts. Let's say it's within the context of. Um, Let's say I'm testing out a, uh, uh, a pain medication, like, like a headache medication, like Advil or Tylenol. Let's, let's say it's a new one called X, uh, medication X. And I want to know how effective it is. Well, I do all my trial, my trial runs, right? I have 100,000 people or 1,000 people um, uh, participate in this experimental study. And what they do is they come into this lab and then uh, they come in with a headache, a pre-existing headache. That's my target audience, people who get headaches. They come into the lab. And, and they do all the paperwork. And then I say, question one, on a scale of one to 10, what's your pain? Um, you know, and, and you mark eight. All right, take this pill, take this new pain medication, medication X, take the medication, and let's give it uh, 30 to 45 minutes to kick in, have some water, relax, and now indicate your level of pain. It was eight, and now it's at a six. Okay, seems like it worked, right? Maybe, maybe it was the pill. Maybe it was the environment. Maybe it was the water. Maybe it was just sitting down for 30 to 45 minutes and that was enough. I came in with a headache because I, you know, I've, I'm participating in this experiment. I had to um, hit some traffic and I, you know, parking spot and this and that. I took the elevator to get to your lab and now I'm here, signed in. I'm sitting down. What's my pain level right now? Oh, gosh, it's, it's like a nine. Okay, it's a nine. Take this pill and let's wait 30, 45 minutes. Um, now it's a seven, now it's a six. Well, what if I hadn't taken that pill? What if it was the same thing and it says, hey, what's 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 your headache on a scale of one to 10? It's a nine. Um, have a glass of water and sit down for 30 to 45 minutes. Now what's your pain? Well, that's counterfactual. That's my explanation of counterfactual. Um, the point is we don't know what your pain would be had you not taken the pill. You took the pill, at an, you were a nine, you took the pill, 30 to 45 minutes later, your pain went down to a six. So we conclude, hey, the pill worked. It was the pill, this new drug. Um, but how do I know that, that the reason why it went down is because of the pill? I don't know. And that's, and that's counterfactual. Um, it's something that it's, it's, it's inherent and it's not, this is different than a hypothetical fact, by the way. I'm just explaining this to help you understand a different, this is a different way of understanding hypothetical facts. So chances are it is the drug, right? But but just like think think back to juror number eight, Henry Fonda's character, like, yeah, but what if it was something else? What if it was the environment? What if it was the music playing? What if it was just the climate and the whole, hey, I'm in this lab and it's really comfortable and I'm relaxed. Some soft music playing, the air conditioning feels good. The water is delicious. It tastes like the ions are really good. Um, is that what caused it? Or is that what could cause my, my pain to go down? Um, so anyways, counterfactual. So when we're talking about what you don't know, like, you know, be, mind, be mindful of, of that whole concept. It's complicated. So hopefully that helped. Hopefully you, you understand a little bit about what I just said because... <laughs> Anytime I talk about this concept of counterfactual with my friends, um, it's it's not something I really ever bring up. But every once in a great while, I seem I somehow seem to find a place where it's relevant, and then I talk about it. And usually, the response is kind of like, "What? Like, okay, I kind of understand what you're talking about." But anyways, um, it might sink in over time. It's important to know the difference between a, a fact and an inference. The authors provide a nice uh, table or box, box 5-1 if you want to test the degree to which you understand the difference. Look through box 5-1 and, and look at, um, w try to determine if that's a fact or inference. Uh, approximately 14% of Americans live in poverty. That would be fact, right? That's something that's empirically verifiable. You can, you can look that up. In chess, a bishop may only move diagonally. 
is that an inference? It's like, no, that's the rule of chess, right? You look up chess, what does a bishop do? A bishop can only move diagonally, that's a rule. It's a fact. Uh, but if I say cigarettes are more dangerous than marijuana, is that a fact? It gets a little complicated. What do you mean by dangerous? What do you mean that they're more dangerous? Now we're, now we're not talking about facts. You could say, uh, fact, cigarette is made of these chemicals. Fact, uh, cigarettes have this effect on your blood or your lungs or whatever. But more dangerous, well, danger, dangerous, now we're talking about more of a, a concept, a value. That's an inference. But try to do that on your own. They, they, they provide you the answers on the back, so that's one thing to, to check. You got to know the difference. So one, one, one way to know the difference is if something is empirical, if, if it has, if it contains an empir empirically verifiable quality, it's probably a fact. But if something is more just opinion or value-based, then it's an inference. So I had this little vignette between me and my dad. We had this conversation about uh, the whole concept of having a water tank at your house and the, the water tanks that provide purified water. The big tanks that you put in your garage, some of you might know what I'm talking about, and, and you put salt in the tank. It requires salt. There's so much technology behind the stuff and I don't understand it that well. But anyways, I was having a conversation with my dad and I was, I was explaining to him how the guy who had it at our house, he said, well, there's no, there's no salt in your, in your water, the water that's in your showers and the water that's in your tubs and all that kind of stuff. The salt is what cleans the filter. That's the short version. But my dad has been, was just convinced. My dad was convinced that there's salt in the water and he, and he stopped his, He's, he canceled his subscription. He's, he canceled his service for this water service because he was convinced that when you put salt in the tank where the filter is, he's convinced that that salt is now the salt that's in your running water in your house and your sink. I'm elaborating on this because this, this is the kind of, this is an example that illustrates how we think and how we make decisions based on good or bad thinking. Anyways, I, and I told my dad, I said, well, dad, what the guy told me who just installed this, he said there's actually no salt in the actual water. And, and he looked at me puzzled and he's like, well, uh, yeah, there is. And I said, I said, how do you know? I said, how do you know there's salt in the water? His response, I just know. I can tell how, by how it feels. <laughs> and I was like thinking, okay, I'm not saying that's not true. What I'm saying is that's not a good reason. That's an inference. He was inferring. He was like, I, I just feel like there's salt on my body. Not that I, you know, no one really knows what that's like. And then I said, are you absolutely sure? Have you tested the water? Like, are you absolutely positive that the water in your house does indeed contain salt, considering the fact that what I just told you? And then he basically said like, well, not now. Like now, now I'm kind of confused, right? That's kind of how our conversation went. So that's a practical application of knowing the difference between fact and inference. Facts matter. There's fake news. Um, you can ignore facts. Ignoring facts doesn't make the problem go away. It just makes you more confused, I guess. One way to look at it. I once was, um, I was walking behind a family member. We were walking somewhere. I was walking behind him and I noticed that he was limping really bad. He had hurt his ankle. He hurt his ankle really bad, fell on it or something. And I'm, I'm walking behind him and I see like one normal looking ankle and one giant ankle. And I'm, I'm not a medical doctor, but I'm thinking that, that doesn't look right. Um, that looks really bad. And it looks, it looks like he's having a lot of pain walking on it. And I just, and I said, I said, Hey, you're going to, are you going to have a doctor take a look at that? That looks pretty, that looks pretty bad. You're limping pretty good. And it looks huge. You're going to have a doctor take a look at it. And his, his response was like, nah. Ah, I've been in the doctor so many times and I thought, okay, he's just ignoring it. And I'm thinking, I don't, I don't get it. Um, fact, his ankle is swollen. Fact, there appears to be pain. I, I, and he would admit that it's painful. So there's lots of facts that would lead to a conclusion of you should go see a doctor, but you just ignore them. Or I don't know if he is ignoring them or I don't, I don't know the, the full story, but that's that. So value, moving on to value judgment claims, slide nine. So now we're getting into a much more tricky thing. The whole like dangerous smoking marijuana or smoking cigarettes is more dangerous than smoking marijuana or vice versa. Now that's a value. We're talking about value. We're talking about attitude. We're talking about more complex things. Um, 
things that are not necessarily empirically verifiable because we're, we're dealing with a, a, a complex construct called danger, right? If that's, if it's that example. So I have this slide of, of all this ice cream with um, the, the expression de gustibus non est disputandum. It's a Latin expression, which means in matters of taste, there can be no disputes. So value claims are rooted in opinion. When it comes to matters of taste, things can get, things can get a little complicated. If your favorite flavor of ice cream is chocolate, and it's always been chocolate, you love chocolate, you've tasted others, and you've still made the conclusion, chocolate's my favorite. If I try to convince you that it should be pistachio, if I said, hey, you gotta try pistachio ice cream, it's so good. I think it should be your favorite. It's my favorite. I mean, it's not my favorite, but it is really good. You might look at me like I'm crazy, and you're saying like, I've had pistachio, it's okay. But chocolate's my favorite. In matters of taste, there can be no disputes. My my mouth, you know, my tongue, I, I, I eat it, and it's like, that's my favorite. I don't, that's it, case closed, right? I don't have to present more evidence than it tastes good. It's my favorite. Um, so I, I, I mentioned that because I, I want to illustrate the, the complexity with which you might experience when, when you're engaging in an argument with someone when dealing with values. It gets complicated. It's complicated. That's where the term came from, by the way. Um, so value claims can still be backed by by grounds. You can still you can still make an obviously you're going to make your your best argument if it's a value claim, a value argument by factual support. Um, if if you're asking someone questions, if you say, "Hey, if not, what makes you think that?" If if, if your whatever your topic is. If you don't agree with it, you know, I'm talking about someone, I'm having a discussion with someone and they say, well, I don't agree with, I don't agree with that statement or I don't agree with you. I might say, well, why is that? Why do you think that? You'd be amazed at what you, what kinds of responses you get from people when you just ask questions like, how did you arrive at that conclusion? What makes you think that way? Why do you feel that way? Um, and oftentimes you'll get good answers and oftentimes you'll get uh, irrational emotionally loaded answers, depending on the, the, the nature of, of the conversation. Everyone's entitled to her opinion. So when it comes to value claims, um, I, I might be making a claim about a value, but it's just my opinion. And if it's not supported by anything, it's a uninformed, unsupported opinion. Nevertheless, we can all have opinions. Um, the authors talk about the different, different categories of best, worst, appropriate, wrong, morally reprehensible, rude. These are all, these are all terms that deal with, you know, values. So within value claims, if someone is making an argument that something is a, is not appropriate, well, what, you have to define, what do you mean by appropriate? <clears throat> what are the social norms for what's considered appropriate? You can make that argument. It's more, it's a rhetorical argument that can be more complicated. Like that behavior right now in this context, that's, that's inappropriate. Why? Why is that inappropriate? Well, here's why, and and that leads to a can lead to a very unique discussion. That was that was a very rude behavior. What do you mean by rude? What was rude about it? Uh, right. So it's uh, things can get a little tricky when it comes to value. Value claims. Okay, moving on to slide eleven. Other types of claims. Policy claims. We've already talked about this. Is a policy claim is when you're advocating a specific course of action. I, I'll remind you this a bunch, but a lot of students, when they hear when they hear the term policy claim, they think policy, they think government policy. I have a I have a friend of mine who um, he got his he got a master's degree. I think he said I think he said in public administration, and he said I just love policy. He said I love reading about policies and and how they're created and how they're how they're implemented and how it affects things. So. My friend Isaac, man, if I want to know about policies and the nature of policies, like government policies and corporate policies and um, union policies, I'll go to him. When I say policy in this context, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about just the, the basic notion of I'm, I'm advocating a specific course of action should or should not take place. That's what I mean by policy. And, it, you know, maybe it should just be called a should a should thing. Um, when you hear the word should or ought to, should not do this, don't do that. Now, now we are getting into a policy claim. Um, the authors also talk about definitional claims. How do you define things? If you in in the midst of an argument, 
in the midst of an argument, a lot of times people will use terms and, and they're terms that need a definition. Some terms you probably don't need to define. If I'm talking about something and I, and I mentioned that I was boiling water, you might say, well, could you define what you mean by boiling water? Uh, I could, and, and I actually had this conversation with a friend of mine in graduate school. Um, we like to think that the, the concept of boiling water is pretty objective. We looked it up in, in uh, like Wikipedia and there was a definition of boiling water. And it was something like when the water reaches a temperature of something like 182 degrees Fahrenheit and there is a, um, uh, a gr it was like uh, bubbling when it's, when the water is bubbling um, aggressively. I f I'm sorry, I forget the specific term it was. So let's say that's the metric, 182 degrees and the water is boiling aggressively. Well, what do you mean by aggressive? Because, hey, my water is 182 degrees, but it's not boiling the way that, the way that it's described in this definition. Right. So does that mean it's not boiling? I don't know. Right. Um, I, I mentioned this because it, it, it relates to the story of Rachel Dolezal. I'll just talk about it in a second. So the authors talk about the story of Rachel Dolezal. Um, but in, a, in, in the midst of a definition, definitional claim, if I want to understand what you mean by something, I'll ask you, how do you define that? What do you mean by rich? If someone, uh, my, my cousin, I mean, my, um, I heard my niece the other day talk about this concept or a long time ago, talk about a concept of, hey, is that person rich? Is that person rich? It's like, what do you mean by rich? What does that even mean? Can you define that? Because we say, is this person rich? Yes or no? Well, it's not that simple. Like define rich. Um, I eat healthy. Like, what do you mean by eating healthy? How do we define what it means to eat healthy? Or someone accused you of something. Someone accused you of being rude. Or you accuse me of being rude. I might say, you said I was being rude. Could you explain what you mean by rude? Now, if I if I was accused of being rude and that was my response, I think a lot of people would be like, man, that's a really rude response to a rude response. Um, the tone is everything. If, if I just if, if I was as neutral as possible and I said, uh, you mentioned that I was being rude. Could you explain what I what you mean by being rude versus uh, you said I was being rude. What do you mean by rude? Well, now that's rude. It, the tone is rude. Tone matters, right? These things are complicated. So the authors talk about the story of Rachel Dolezal. Maybe you've heard of her. She's the former head of the NAACP, NAACP in Spokane, Washington. Um, so her story came out back in two, early 2000s, I forget. Or no, I'm sorry, I don't remember. But but it's in, it's in the video. I think it was 2015, actually. Um, so the link right there on the bottom of the, the slide on, on slide 11, where it says Rachel Dolezal, that very last link, that's an interview with her and Matt Lauer on the Today Show from, I think that was back in 2015. So she, Rachel Dolezal, uh, was born as a white Caucasian female. And, and later she went on to say things as, uh, to say, to, to specifically say, I she said, I identify as black. I identify as African American, and then she went through a variety of changes with her with her hair and um, something with her skin. I don't know exactly don't don't exactly know all the details, but then she became the the head of the NAACP in Spokane, Washington, which is primarily it's I mean it's a it's a it's an organization for African Americans, right? And somehow they assumed that she was a lighter skinned African American, um, something along those lines. So when pe when when some somehow the the somehow her story was leaked. I don't know all the details, but it's it's a very very unusual and bizarre to say the least story of definitional claims. What does it mean to be black? If you ask her what it means to be black, she's going to have a much different answer than if you ask um, someone who is who is black, who I would say would fall into the category that everyone would say this person is black. Not many people at all would say Rachel Dolezal was black um, based on how it's defined. So uh, I would definitely say watch, watch the, watch the, it's a 10 minute interview. It's, it's very, it, it, like every time I've seen her talk on things like this, or I, or I, I paid it, I pay attention to the careful way in which she answers questions and is, it's just, it's all, it's all relevant to what we're talking about in this class.
So with her, it, if I if I made the argument, well, you're not like you're not black, and she would respond. She would respond differently. Um, so I'm not taking a, a judgment on her. I'm not taking a position, but but nevertheless, it's a very unique illustration of of definitional claims. And and um, other examples where you might not encounter a, a Rachel Dolezal type of example. Let's say somebody claimed in the notes there, if someone claimed the agriculture industry is a leading cause of deforestation in the U.S., well, what do you mean by leading cause? Let's, so let's define things. That's a claim. The agriculture industry, ag is, is, the, ag is mostly responsible for deforestation. That's, that's a claim, which that claim is the basis of a documentary film called Cowspiracy. If, you're, if, you, if you wanna know way more about that specific topic, the documentary film called Cows Cowspiracy is is all about that. But that's the claim, right? What do you mean by leading cause? Like I have to define what leading cause is by putting it in a context. What's the leading cause of lung disease? What's the leading cause of other things? So I have to I have to give that the term leading cause. I have to somehow uh, explain that. What do you mean by um, what do you mean by deforestation? Right, I could def I could define deforestation, and it, by my definition of deforestation, you might say, "Well, isn't that something that happens naturally from the thunder?" If I, I'm one of those guys where I don't I don't watch a whole lot of shows, but I'll, I will like uh, I'll just admit if, if if my wife's gone or something like that, I'll watch shows on like nature and, and our our planet, and I'm not so ashamed of that. I think it's amazing. I'm fascinated by it. But one of the things that's extremely fascinating is deforestation you might say like an or, a natural way of deforestation. There might be oftentimes there's there's thunder, lightning, um, or there's lightning. It causes a major forest fire, all natural, right? An act of God, which is which is the terminology that will often be used for that type of thing, an act of God. Um, thunder, not thunder, but, but lightning strikes uh, dead old trees in the wood, and all of a sudden a natural forest fire built, burns hundreds of thousands of acres. Um, and then new stuff grows. That's been going on since the earth was around, right? But if your argument is, hey, well, deforestation is something that happens naturally. Well, if you, after taking this course, after reading this book and, and understanding how things work, how arguments work, you might turn around and say, well, that's a faulty analogy to reasoning by parallel case. In other words, one type of argument is reasoning by parallel case. If let's say the topic is deforestation, one argument is, hey, you claim that deforestation is wrong and we're using deforestation for the purpose of growing corn to feed animals, right? But hey, deforestation happens naturally. It happens in the woods, it happens through lightning and things regrow. That would be an argument um, uh, where, where the person is using reasoning by parallel case. The, the problem would be, or the, the fallacy is that the faulty analogy to compare that, you know, lightning to tractors or machines doing it. So just in case that's a topic that comes up, now you have some, uh, some stuff to work with. Okay, slide 12. We've already talked about proof. Proof is the grounds for arguments. Proof is uh, the grounds evidence for any kind of claim that's advanced. We want reasons. Humans want reasons. If, if, if you remember the classic line from A Few Good Men, um, I want the truth, right, Tom Cruise? <laughs> I want the truth. And uh, evidence is the reason to accept or deny claims. If I'm in the court of law and you're saying this person did, did do it or didn't do it, it's like, I, I want the truth. I want evidence. I want reasons. I, I'm not just going to take your word for it. That's why we report. So it's, it's part, of our, part of our DNA to, to desire uh, having a, a detailed answer for things, reasons for things. Again, more on the warrant. The, now, now the warrant talk should be review. The authors mentioned an example of the Boswells must be uh, scared of ghosts because they drive a hybrid car. That doesn't make any sense. There's no warrant. But if you say they're, they must be environmentally conscious because they drive a hybrid car, okay, now that makes sense. The warrant is, I get it. If I said they must be environmentally conscious because they drive a hybrid car, I get it. Hybrid car, environmentally conscious. That's the warrant. I don't have to explain it. And if and if you're if you don't get it, then um, look up hybrid car and look up the term environmentally conscious, and you'll, you should be able to figure it out. Inductive reasoning is when you move from observations to broader generalizations. You move from um, smaller observations of different events of uh, different events in like you know 
human experience and then it leads to a broader conclusion. There's different types of ways that we reason. One is through analogy. There's sign reasoning, cause effect, generalization. Um, the warrants for each one of these can be faulty. They can be faulty. We can have faulty uh, reasoning and that leads to fallacies. But if, uh, with analogies, the warrant is based on how similar the two are. That, so analogy is reasoning by parallel case, same, kind of the same difference, like the example I just gave you with deforestation. I, I recently, or in you know, the last year or so, I heard this person give a discussion. He was making, I, I heard this person give a, an argument on preventing racism and preventing COVID. And so his argument was based on um, uh, reasoning through analogy, reasoning by parallel case. That was his argument. And his argument was, hey, we should be treating the prevention of racism in the same way that we're treating the prevention of COVID. And he made some some examples with, with how that what that looks like. But um, I'm thinking, especially coming from a white person, you know, the person who said there's a white person, I'm thinking like, man, that's a, an, a very unusual thing to say, a very uncommon, unusual thing to say for someone like you. But but that's beside the point. It, it is part of the whole thing, uh, who you are in terms of what you say. Those, those, are, those things are important. But it doesn't work. It, it's a faulty analogy to talk about preventing racism and, and, and make that analogous and liken that to preventing COVID. That just doesn't make sense. It gets people's attention, but it's all based on false pretenses. It's a faulty analogy. It's a fallacy. Sign reasoning is when you have sufficient size, sufficient signs to make a conclusion. If I said, hey, it's raining. How do you know? I'm in the rain. It's falling on me. I can see it in the sky. Okay, that's sufficient reasoning. But let's say I'm inside a building and then I see people walk in and I see a, a person walk in with an umbrella. Well, if I saw one person walk in with an umbrella, let's say a classroom. When I, when I used to work at LSU, it rained all the time. It rains a ton in the South. So if I, saw, if I saw a student walk in the class with an umbrella, I wouldn't automatically assume it's raining. Let's assume I'm in a window, I'm, I'm in a building or classroom where I can't see outside. Student walks in with an umbrella. I could make the argument, oh, I, I see someone with, with an umbrella. It must be raining, right? Because the warrant is, you know, the people who hold umbrellas when it's raining to prevent them from getting wet. The, the claim, I see an umbrella because with the, with the grounds, with the proof, because he's holding an umbrella, right? Or I mean, the claim is it must be raining because he's holding an umbrella. But that's insufficient. If I just saw one thing, uh, raise any by signs, if I saw one sign, one person had a, an umbrella, that's not enough. That's an insufficient amount of evidence. I need more. I need more signs. Okay, first student walked in with an umbrella. And then over the next 30 students, I saw patterns. I saw several students holding an umbrella. And then I saw several students who were a little bit wet. And then I saw a handful of students who were dripping wet, absolutely dripping wet. At that point, I, I, can make, I, I feel confident to make the conclusion uh, it's raining outside, especially because it's Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and it'll, it'll just rain. It'll go from being nice and sunny and you blink your eyes and all of a sudden it's like pouring down rain for five minutes and you blink your eyes and it's sunny again. It's like, what? Uh, and if you've ever experienced that before, then you know how crazy that is. Um, so that's sign reasoning. Cause effect is proof that one thing caused another. If I'm making, the, if I'm, uh, if I'm making an argument that the cause of this fire was arson versus accidental, I have to have cause effect. Um, the cause is arson. What's the proof? I don't know about fire science, so I won't be able to really elaborate on that. But within fire science, you would you would be able to determine like this is a sign. Uh, this is this is evidence to prove the fact that it's um, arson versus accidental. A toaster versus gasoline. If we located the 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 cause of this fire, it's a toaster was plugged in incorrectly or something like that or whatever. <clears throat> we might conclude that it was accidental. But if we look at things differently, we might see gasoline or gas can, the, the patterns of how fire works, that's beyond what I understand. But that's the cause. Um, evidence is, you know, fire science evidence. And then the effect is fire, right? That's the argument. And then generalization, people make general generalizations. If you're a repeat offender, history tends to repeat itself, right? That's, you can generalize about, about that kind of thing. If if I, if I knew you well enough, I've known you for your whole life and you tend to do the same things time and time again, I can generalize that when you're in a certain situation, you're probably going to act a certain way. 
and that can be good or bad or just or just neutral um so yeah slide 14 i just have the same stuff on slide 14. so these are all different types of ways to understand the nature of the warrant within different types of arguments and analogy sign cause effect generalization um and it's important to know that there's potential fallacies in reasoning for all these types of arguments. So, hopefully, you have a little bit more, a, a, a little bit more of an enhanced understanding of the nature of arguments, claims, warrants, etc. This is something that you're not all going to fully understand. You're not going to fully digest it in your in your first sitting. You're going to have to continue to um, just work through that stuff, through these work through these concepts, and grapple with the ideas, and, and really challenge yourself. So hope you're all doing great. That's it for chapter five on the building blocks of arguments. I'll talk to you later. Bye.